YouTube Live today as we have been discussing best practices to develop clinical judgment. And today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, the ability and how do we can use case studies. You know, why case studies and really making the case for a case-based curriculum. And so we'll be talking about that in just a few minutes and we'll jump right in. And I want you to bring your questions, kind of bring your, as it relates to using case studies successfully and effectively. We'll be going to that in detail, sharing you some of the strategies from the nursing literature, as well as from my dissertation, as well as just some practical examples of some of the cases that I've developed and how we want to basically strengthen a case-based curriculum and bringing that active learning strategy to our program. You know, if we haven't met, my name is Keith and I'm the founder of Keith RN. And I've been doing this for about 10 years as a nurse educator, as well as a clinical nurse who never left the bedside. And it's my passion to really restore practice emphasis into nursing education by empowering educators to use the best possible tools and strategies to develop clinical judgment that'll prepare us, prepare our students for both practice as well as next gen NCLEX. And so really, I really enjoy, I wouldn't say enjoy, but it's really my pleasure to challenge the status quo in nursing education, because we need to do things differently. As Dr. Benner advocated over um, 12 years ago in 2010, educating nurses a call for radical transformation, we need to change and that ch needed change has not been realized yet. And so anyways, I can't do it without you and it's a pleasure to have you with us. If you're here with me tonight live, this recording lives on my YouTube and uh, Facebook lives. I'll be sharing the link here shortly, but tell me who you are, where you're coming from. And I look forward to connecting with you tonight, as well as it's one week from today that about uh, 1.30 in the afternoon central, I'll be doing my presentation at the NCSBN Virtual Next Gen Conference. Uh, Dr. Phil Dickinson invited me to present on just how do we bring classroom strategies effectively to make the classroom a place to develop clinical judgment. So I'm going to have an hour and a half and I'm gonna give it my best shot. And I, and I guarantee you I have and will. And today we're gonna to be kind of talking about some of the big picture as far as why case studies, but also have a chance to share some things that I was not able to address in the presentation, just because you can't do it all uh, when you have those opportunities. And so Carol, it's a pleasure to have you uh, uh, here again. I know you're a frequent, uh, I wouldn't call you a frequent flyer, but a frequent attender and Katie and from BC. My father's from Winnipeg. I know that's British Columbia. So welcome and thank you, Katie. So blessing to have Canadian educators who are also concerned about next gen and really wanting to kind of just, and more importantly, I think, you know, we've got to move the paradigm from next gen to really saying, let's just develop clinical judgment to best prepare students for practice. And I see Gianna uh, from Miami Dade College School of Nursing. Blessing to have you here, Gianna. Blessings. Thank you again. And so again, what I shared at the very intro is that we're going to be talking about case studies and really looking at the evidence, looking at some of the things that we want to use to successfully integrate clinical and, you know, integrate case-based learning into our curriculum. And so what I'm going to start with tonight is basically kind of laying ground zero of where do we start as it relates to developing clinical judgment. In fact, one thing I forgot to mention is that I had a wonderful conversation with Dr. Janet Managel, uh, an educator from Massachusetts who's nationally known, has written articles in the nursing literature. We had a wonderful conversation just last week on really some of the nuanced strategies and approaches that we can use besides case studies. We talked about structured reflection. We talked about questioning and what questions do we want to ask? I'll be talking about that next week uh, at the NCSBN conference, but Janet talked about that last week, did a wonderful job. And I just wanna share where that link lives so that you can essentially um, go to that uh, link if you would choose to. And it's on my YouTube channel, which is really my best channel for nurse educators. It's easy to access. You can subscribe to it. It's called Think Like a Nurse. 
And, uh, and that resource has numerous videos. All of the Facebook Lives I've done over the last two to three years are there. Short YouTubes, YouTubes for class, for your students. Got some wonderful topics and really just, again, wanting to advocate and uh, for the needed change in our profession and how we teach it. So anyways, just want to commend you to that. I also want to just kind of highlight and at least give you the link to Dr. Benner's book that really, you know, you I'm, I'm going to start from ground zero very briefly. And many of you who've been following me, she's always worth repeating because the things that Dr. Benner had to share 12 years ago are still needed. And educating nurses, a call for radical transformation. How many of you have read it who are in the audience tonight? If you've read it, I'd love to know what your takeaways were. You know, for me as a new educator back in 2010, I was feeling the disconnect. You know, I was feeling and experiencing the academic practice gap. I saw firsthand this disconnect between how nursing is taught and how it was practiced. And it wasn't pretty. And, you know, three-part NANDA statements and, you know, extensive lectures that focused on content, but not application. And, you know, Dr. Benner had three paradigm shifts that I really rocked my world. I'll be talking about them as well at the NCSBN conference. But the three that I want to highlight for us, because what we want to do as educators is embrace educational best practices to teach nursing. You know, it's not optional. You know, just as clinical best practices aren't optional if you're a staff nurse, you know, to scrub the hub with chlorhexidine versus alcohol, we know which one improves outcomes and prevents incidence of line infections and sepsis at CHG or chlorhexidine. You don't have an option to use alcohol if you're going to have the best outcomes for patients. And I really think it's important that sometimes in nursing education, we resist change, even though the evidence tells us to do differently. You know, so Dr. Benner talked about the three shifts that we need to make as educators um, to really bring about needed change. And I'm going to highlight them very briefly. The first one is contextualize our content to the bedside of patient care. We can no longer teach information alone. It has to have a hook of context. That's how it sticks in the brain, in the cortex. When there's literally a scaffold or a hook of context, whether it's clinical context, case-based context, simulation context, we want to bring a hook that literally hooks it and connects it to practice. That's why just lots of information gets lost the next day, they may memorize it to pass the test, but then it's gone. So we need to start there. Second paradigm shift, bring class and clinical together. We need to bring clinical realities into our class. Case-based learning, your stories from practice, bringing clinical salience to cl classroom. And then finally, the third, emphasize clinical reasoning and multiple ways that a nurse thinks, but an emphasis on the thinking in action skill of clinical reasoning. And you know, the NCSPN has six steps of clinical reasoning. Tanner's framework, a practice-based framework, has four steps of that noticing, interpreting, responding, and reflecting that all align with the NCSPN model, which is a measurement model only. We should not be teaching that to our students. They don't need to know how to write a test question using the six steps, which is measurement only, the NCSBN. Tanner's framework is practice informed. That's the kind of questions we want to use in our program and what that looks like. And for some of you who may not be familiar with Tanner's clinical judgment model, it's the essence of the six steps. In fact, you know, the NCSBN just didn't make that model up or pull it out of the air. It came directly from Tanner's framework in her article titled Thinking Like a Nurse, a Research-Based Model and Framework of Clinical Judgment in 2006. And it's still timeless and relevant to how we develop the judgment for practice. So I commend you to that article and what that looks like. And so let me just pause for a moment and just uh, see some of the questions here. And, you know, Kathy says, Dr. Benner's book changed the way I approach education. And, you know, Kathy, I'd like to know, just throw it in the chat. How did it rock your world? And how did it affect how you taught? You know, what were you doing? What did you do differently? One of the limitations of this live stream, I can't get your audio feeds. 
I can only communicate through the chat. So put your thoughts and communicate in the chat. Um, I do have this comment, though, from Judy. She says, there's a disconnect between how nursing is taught and practice. Example, three shifts, one contextual hook to the bedside practice, classic clinical, my stories emphasize clinical reasoning. You know what? She's just, you're just repeating kind of the things that I just shared there, Judy, but it's awesome. And that's in essence, you know, exactly what we need to be doing um, to basically do things differently. So thank you for sharing that. And, uh, and you're spot on because that's exactly what Dr. Benner said and what we need to be doing differently. And so when you look at these paradigm shifts, what strategy, I have a thinking question, what strategy can we use as educators that brings context to class, integrates class and clinical and emphasizes the reasoning or thinking skills? Well, for me, as a new educator who was at the bedside, I had a Baylor weekend shift. I was working 12 hour nights every Friday and Saturday, ER, ICU, rapid response team in the critical care float pool of a large metro hospital here in the Twin Cities then taught in the classroom Monday morning. I brought my stories and my and I began to write case studies because I saw the light. Dr. Benner's paradigm shift said, it's case studies. And I didn't know it at the time, but there's a wealth of literature evidence. I'm gonna highlight here tonight and just highlight some brief findings from my dissertation so that you as educators can say, you know what? There's a reason that the NCSBN, next gen, NCLEX is using case studies to measure and evaluate clinical judgment because it's an educational best practice that we as nurse educators must bring into our classrooms. Because what I want to give you a vision for as it relates to case-based learning and scenario-based, problem-based learning of practice is that clinical judgment is the most important skill your students must possess. But like any other skill, it too needs to be practiced over and over and over again. And so therefore, clinical experiences are often not that can be variable across the board. Some students get a great experience, some don't. We had a limitation of clinical experiences with the COVID pandemic, and some programs are still struggling to still get adequate clinical placements today. So what can we as educators do to fill in the gap? You know, we can, we can only change so much. We can, we can only change what we can do, which is changing the way we teach. And that's basically bringing a case-based approach to all that we do in the classroom. And so um, that's what I want to kind of just kind of start with. And I just want to ask a couple, I got some questions and comments here. So let me just kind of throw those up for us all to see. And uh, Giannina says, one of the things I learned from your lessons is to decrease the amount of information in my PowerPoints. And, you know, Giannina, you know, I'll just highlight what, why that's so important is that cognitive load is real. And cognitive load is a science of learning theory that simply states your cortex can only hold so much information before it's dripping on the floor. Your, your retrieval ability, your short-term memory isn't exhaustive. It's not infinite. Therefore, we need to actually teaching less. And Dr. Benner had a great quote in Educating Nurses. She said, deep learning of what is most important. You know, that's a mantra for every nurse educator listening to this live stream, either live or on the recording is to embrace that paradigm in your program, in your classroom, deep knowledge of what is most important. And that's where you can bring case studies and other strategies to bring context of what is most important. And so, yes, um, and that's the reason why, Giannina, that we just kind of want to basically bring that perspective into our classrooms, less is more. And so, yes, Judy's saying I'm taking notes because I agree and plan to share with other educators. I do not see us as educators practicing this. And, you know, Judy, I'd like to say, why not? This was written 12 years ago. I spoke at the Elsevier National Conference for three years in a row, and I've been doing everything with Keith Aaron in my power to make it visible, as have other educators like Linda Caputi and Iggy. Um, you know, back in the day when this first came out, this was a hot topic. You know, I'd like to know why haven't we gotten there yet? You know, that's really the splinter in my brain that really discourages me. You know, I've been working so hard writing case studies, revising case studies, creating the best possible tools. 
And then I just kind of see that sometimes there's just like the lack of really energy to really want to do what's needed. And too much is at stake. And so, Judy, if you have any thoughts, please put it in the chat because I'd love to get your get your feedback. Kathy has this comment. I've integrated more Socratic questions, case studies in which I integrated patient-centered focus. Kathy, my hat is off to you because that's what every one of us need to do. And I'm sure you're all doing that at different levels. And, you know, Socratic, you know, Socrates had a great comment that I've never forgotten. He said, I can't teach my students, my philosophy students in the forum anything. I can only teach them to think. And, you know, Spoon feeding our students, giving them what they want to know to pass the test, though they demand it and insist upon it sometimes, we must always resist that because we will not develop the thinking of clinical judgment unless they do the work of learning while we do our best to teach. And so that Socratic approach, Kathy, it's beautiful. And it's open-ended questions. It's the why questions, the what questions, you know, the essence of Tanner's framework made into questions like the first step of noticing. What do you notice that is most important? What does it mean? Is a very simple way of using Socratic questions open-ended questions to develop the thinking of our students using a practice-informed framework of clinical judgment, which is Tanner. So again, we talked about that last week. Um, also, uh, I got a comment here from Kathy. Love the feedback tonight, guys. Thanks so much. It's great to have the interaction. I've also focused on pathophys. It's vitally important that students understand what is physiologically happening in order to pick up the cues and act. And Kathy, as an ICU ER nurse who's kind of, you know, in those high stake areas, you know, I see the relevance of pathophysiology to practice, but that's true for all areas of nursing practice. It really is the golden thread that allows a student to notice what is most important because they understand pathophysiology and then can interpret the meaning of what that high temperature means, that elevated heart rate, that declining blood pressure, vascular tone, sepsis, septic shock, they understand it. If they've just memorized that content, they're going to be roadkill in practice because they won't have the they won't have the that knowledge that they can apply and use at the bedside. So this is why clinical judgment is really kind of a, a very important point that it's not just using a next gen product or doing case studies by themselves. We've got to be teaching differently. And I'm going to be sharing some ways that we can do that. And so great questions. And yeah, Jan, I, I agree. Simulation is also, you know, the problem with simulation, I love high fidelity sim. How many times do your students get to do it in the course of a semester? Once, twice, three times is kind of the norm. And the essence is to really develop the repetitive, repetitive thinking that's not enough. And I'll talk about how many, how much do we need to implement active learning, case-based learning to really strengthen and to develop clinical judgment in our students. I'll share that in just a little bit. So don't go away. Um, what I just like to highlight is really, you know, I was blessed to complete my dissertation, my PhD studies in 2020 at William Carey University on unfolding case studies and its development of clinical judgment. I'm not gonna go into my study, but when I did my lit review, there's a there's a, there was about 15 studies that really got to the root of case-based learning. And you know what I identified with some of the themes of case studies to improve learning is that it's it, it is this. The more often you use case studies, the, the ability to develop the clinical the clinical judgment improves. Now, some of the studies used two case studies a semester. Some used four. Some used eight in a semester. Guess which number? Anybody have a thought as far as how many case studies needed to be done as an intervention in the course of a 16-week semester to make a noticeable improvement that they could measure of clinical, of critical thinking? Anybody have a guess? in the chat. It takes about 15 seconds. Well, I can tell you that my study used four interventions and it was shortened because of COVID. It wasn't enough. Jamie says 10. 
Um, Kathy says two. That's not enough, Kathy. You know what the see? You know what the magic number was? There were two K. There were two studies that had the same number, and they both improved critical thinking skills at a significant level. And Jennifer, you get the prize. It is eight. Eight case study interventions. You know, that's every other week. So really, when you look at how can we as educators develop the clinical judgment that our students need, I would say that case studies need to be a foundational strategy because it brings the paradigm shifts that are needed in nursing education and they practice the judgment. But every other week, every two weeks is a minimum. So I would agree with you, Michelle, once a week is, um, is, is what I would go for. If you are doing one active learning intervention of a scenario, asking Tanner's framework questions like, what are you noticing? What does it mean? How does the nurse respond? Here's your evaluation data. Now what does this, now what's happening? You know, we use those questions with scenarios from our own lens of practice, which is the essence of a good case study we can develop that uh, that thinking. And so again, once a week, but really every other week is the minimum. And so I want to encourage you, how many, when you look at your, at your teaching right now as educators, how often are you using a meaningful active learning activity? Not a game, not talking about Jeopardy and who wants to be a nurse. I'm talking about developing critical thinking, clinical judgment skills, using case-based scenarios. How, how many times are we using that in a semester? You know, be vulnerable. You know, we are all on a journey. You know what? And Greta, every time, you know what, Greta? <laughs> That's the standard. That's our goal as educators, Greta. I love that. So blessed to hear you say that. And I know many of you are doing that as well. But, you know, our goal as educators is to bring some form of application, a short case study, a scenario, reflection, every time we teach in the classroom. That's the repetition that's needed. You know, Kathy says one or two per week. Wonderful. Um, it is a lot of work, Greta. I'm going to share some of my cases with you and show you what I've developed and also what's new. I've got a new revision of my case studies I'm gonna be sharing here shortly with you at the end of this uh, Facebook Live for the first time and what's coming and doing my best efforts to really create the best tools for educators. But you know, Carol Daly has this and Carol, we've been in touch, but you have a DNP project implementing four within seven weeks. That's perfect, Carol. That's the one every other week setting and I'm excited to see what you do. I think you're using case studies very similar to mine uh, or adapting them. If I don't, if I recall correctly, I know they're very close. So I commend you on that. I'm looking forward and really would love to have you on this Facebook Live. I'm doing an on-air invite, but when you get your study done, regardless of your findings, we're gonna talk in front of other educators and share your story and what you learned. Um, so anyways, yes, Destiny says we use role play. And so I love just kind of getting a sense because we can learn from each other. You know, I have my journey and all of you have your own, but we're all on the path to strengthen how we teach or you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be interested in this, uh, in this session. So I'm so glad you're here, but again, role playing, you know, again, role modeling and example, and that's kind of like case studies made live. You know, it's kind of like doing the same thing of bringing scenarios, context, to what you're doing. So well done, Destiny, and keep that up. And, uh, and you know, and, and Kathy says, would you, um, would, did you or will you publish your dissertation? And you know what, Kathy, it is, um, it is on my, um, it, it is on the database, the, whatever it is, but I'll find it if I have a chance during this chat, I'll go and find the Amazon S3 link and I'll pop it in so you can download the PDF immediately. And uh, yes, it was just done in 2020 on unfolding case studies and clinical judgment. And so, yes, I think you'd find it helpful. And Carol, I'll share it with you. If nothing else, I'll email it to you as well, since I think we've been in touch. So anyways, I got one long comment here. I just want to get, I, I, I actually can't read the entirety. So I'm going to basically kind of just read it. Jessica says this, we are trying to increase our simulation hours in our program to bridge the gap between theory and clinical. Wonderful. It says, currently our students have five theory simulations 
and two clinical simulations in their first semester, which is five months. We implement case studies in the classroom. My mental health students complete a minimum of five. We love your clinical reasoning questions, so we are creating patient charts and we'll have the students complete the clinical reasoning questions in class. You know, Jessica, that's wonderful. And you know, you're doing a variety of, of strategies. You're using questioning, which is a distinct strategy. You're using case studies. You're using simulation. You know, that's the kind of interaction we need to do. So when we look at developing clinical judgment, Let's not obsess about two column and three column matrices and drop down clothes and all the different alternative types. Let it go. That's really not that important. They're just multiple choice questions on steroids. Okay. Develop the thinking. So these questions that you're using, Jessica, and really what I've done with the, you know, the clinical reasoning questions you're, you're, you're kind of representing here, you know what, that's just Tanner's framework made into questions, really. I took Tanner and nursing process and just look at how I think and reason as a nurse in practice, and that's what I, and that's what you have. So great job and, and doing that. And so, you know, again, as we look at, as we look at some of the, you know, the, the, the benefits of cases, students, love to see the big picture. They can, they have increased confidence. Some of the qualitative themes that students felt better prepared for practice, less anxious, because it really brought clinical salience in realities where again, it, it kind of was like a, uh, the ability to kind of just soften the blow of what nursing practice is. If you can practice like simulation, it's a safe environment to make a mistake. When you bring these examples of clinical reasoning into your classroom, you're doing the same thing. And so when you look at some of the qualitative, you know, there's one, there's one lit review I want to commend you to, and it was titled Case-Based Learning and Its Application in Medical and Healthcare Fields, a Review of the Medical Literature. And let me just pop that in there. This link, it has the full text article. I want all of you to download it and get the PDF and view it another time. But there were five big benefits of case-based learning. As you look at kind of, you know, the big picture of what are the learning benefits of case studies? And you know, this is really where case studies can really be the needed solution to bridge the current academic practice gap, as well as other strategies that bring clinical context. Because what they identified in this study that case studies connect theory to practice. You know, again, it's contextualizing content and seeing its relevance. It facilitates the development of clinical judgment. We've already talked about that. Repeated experiences to practice clinical judgment. You see, that's kind of the missing link. If all we're doing is active learn, or all we're doing is just textbook information, 60 slides an hour, give them all the content in the chapter to get them to pass, you know, to get them to just, you know, have a basic knowledge of a lot of information. They don't know how to use it. So again, we want to immerse them in the complexities of practice. And one of the best benefits that I love that came out of this study, case-based learning improves patient outcomes. And you know, medical education, residencies and medical schools for physicians have been using case studies for decades. And you know, they've been a strong proponent of, you know, grand rounds, case-based learning. Nursing education as a pedagogy, you know, we're, we're getting there. And in fact, you know, one of the studies that Janet, Janet Menegel mentioned last week, 98% of all nursing programs are using case studies as a teaching strategy, the most common. So I'm excited about that. And again, you know, I want us to get a vision for not only just using case studies, but to use them effectively because not all case studies are created equal and we must know how to use the tool successfully. So when I looked at my dissertation, and I want to give you some big picture strategies, and then we're going to make it practical. And I'm going to share some of the things that I've developed with case studies that I hope you find helpful. And I'll share some pearls of how to write good scenarios. I'll be doing that at the NCSBN conference next week. I'll give you a couple tonight as well. When it comes to case studies, I want you all to think about where do you get your case studies? You know, where are you using case studies? Are they from ATI, Elsevier, uh, Winningham's workbook? Are they are you using my cases? 
um, whatever. I'd love to know what you're using for case studies because that will help me get a finger on the pulse of this audience. And so put in the chat, where are you getting your case studies? And do you, and, 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 and what I want you to do is critically reflect and ask yourself, do the case studies that I'm using right now do this? Because this is educational best practices that are going to move the chains forward to strengthen clinical judgment with your students. So we start with number one. First thing to evaluate your case studies. Are they unfolding or are they single scenario? Now, what that means is this. Does your case study just basically have a, like an initial paragraph and then question, 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 maybe one more little evaluative piece and that's it. That's a single scenario case study. And what the literature in nursing education has shown with my lit review, unfolding scenarios that sequentially unfold like practice, like each question, you know, the first, the scenario, then you have your vital signs, what's relevant and why assessment, labs, it just gradually unfolds, pauses, just like practice. That's more effective to develop clinical judgment. Um, when we talked about the interventions, we've done that already. When you do, when you do case studies in your program, they need faculty guidance. Some of the studies ironically just kind of had students do case-based learning as an online kind of download the case study, like shadow, you know, like some of the online virtual experiences, you just kind of do it as a student with no guidance. That was not nearly as effective. In fact, they had, had very little statistical significance of a change versus faculty guidance. And so what I really want to commend you to is that case-based learning or any form of simulation activity requires faculty guidance. You've got to interact with them. You've got to be asking the questions. Yes, this is a perfect opportunity to be the guide on the side, you know, kind of saying, what do you think? You know, here's the scenario. What do you think? You know, what do you notice that's most important? You know, always start with noticing skills. Next gen will just say, what do you recognize? You know, it's the same, you know, recognize cues using some of the same language of what's most important, what most, what's most concerning. Again, those are the right questions to unpackage the first reasoning process, but we got to guide them. And we also want our case studies to simulate and replicate practice realities as closely as possible. Now, this is for where for me as a new educator, I basically inherited case studies from my, my, my prior faculty, the textbook publishers case studies um, in the as supplements were multiple choice. They were knowledge based. They did not unfold. And at the end of the day, I recognized even as a brand new educator, these really weren't that good. I wasn't being, you know, I, I just, they were not that effective and did not replicate practice. So as an educator, your goal is to really bring as much clinical reality with a case study. Therefore, no multiple choice. Let's just be done with multiple choice or any, even the next gen questions, they're multiple choice. They're just three column multiple choice, two column multiple choice or select all that apply or different forms of, of select, you know, of drop down closes. Again, are just multiple choice questions. You don't have a choice in practice. You see case studies to really replicate and simulate the realities of practice you can't have multiple choice because you don't have it in practice. When I go into a patient's room as a, as, a, as a nurse, I got my data from report, the chart. I either know it or I don't. I don't have four choices to say, oh, yeah, this is the priority. This is what I should notice. That's nice on a test question. But we want to raise the bar in our classrooms, in our clinical and simulation. We use case studies. Make sure they simulate practice. And make sure they also replicate the complexities of practice. You know, textbook learning is linear. It's one topic at a time. That's great for, you know, for a textbook, clinical practice. Have you ever seen a patient with just one problem? Um, 
sometimes, but rarely, if they're an, if they're an inpatient admission, they've got diabetes, they've got heart failure, they've got acute renal on chronic, mental health, overlays, etc. So we need to prepare our students for the complexities of practice. That's where your stories come in. You see, you don't need to have a, you know, a, a, a you know, a case study. You bring your stories, and you share them. You write them down, and you share them with your students. But you want them to simulate practice. No multiple choice, open ended, and you want problems to be solved. You know, you want to have like what to something to be solved or discovered in your case study. And so um, I've got, uh, I've just, uh, I'm going to pause here for a moment. And I would just like to, sh just like you to reflect. You don't have to write in the chat. Do your case studies do that? Do Elsevier case studies? Do Winningham's do that? Does ATI, um, et cetera? Um, I have a, a, you know, so just reflect because I want to strengthen, you know, my, our goal as educators, never stop improving. You know, that's the home motto improvement of Lowe's home improvement stores. It's my motto as an educator, and I know it's all of yours, or you wouldn't be here tonight. Um, Kathy has a great point I want to highlight. It's a really wonderful uh, emphasis. She says, I include social determinants of health and access to health care when guiding students in a case study. Kathy, my hat again is, is just, that's, that's wonderful. And that's exactly, we want to bring the messiness, the realities of social determinants of health and the inequities um, of poverty, of race, and, you know, homelessness, and some of the messy things that are in our culture today, our students are going to see it. We've got to be real about that and bring in that complexities of the messiness of social determinants of health and how that impacts outcomes so we can, again, prepare our students you know, have this, don't get them flat-footed when they enter practice. We want to bring that salience. And so, Kathy, wonderful, well done, and keep it up. And that's where you can bring in, you know, you can make it your own. You can take any case study, just make it better than what you have there. Don't just, you would just, just don't blindly go through that and what that looks like. And uh, Carol says, I use your template for unfolding case studies and use real clinical scenarios for my own practice. Wonderful. What you've done, Carol, is that one-two punch. Your stories, because you have your stories as nurses in practice, they must, your students need your stories, and then have the right framework of questions, which is what my template does inside the membership platform that I offer educators. And so, Carol, well done, and uh, keep doing what you're doing there. And so when you look at kind of, you know, Keith RN, you know, some people say, I love Keith RN case studies. Even students will say they like Keith RN case studies, which blows me away because they're hard. They're open-ended. But they, students say it makes them think. And kind of the things that I did with my case studies 10 years ago, this was before NextClan. This was before Keith RN. This was when I was just a passionate educator bringing my stories and my case-based scenarios to my students using Benner's ideas from educating nurses. And this is what I did. Made them unfolding, integrated Tanner's framework when it was just published. Shortly after it was published in 2006, I saw the value as a master's prepared nurse educator. I used Tanner 10 years ago, operationalized it with open-ended questions, with no guessing, no multiple choice. And then I had a consistent framework. One of the things that I did differently with my case studies is that I basically... When I looked at one of the weaknesses of case studies that I saw, every case study topic had a different set of questions. Now, that might be okay at first glance, but when you look at clinical reasoning, Tanner's framework, noticing, interpreting, responding, reflecting, that doesn't change regardless of the practice setting, whether you're in OB, mental health, peds, med surge, ER, ICU. The reasoning of practice never changes, just the context. So I used a consistent framework of Tanner and open-ended questions in every case study. So a skinny reasoning, which is my shortest and most concise, basically had starts with the same as it has a scenario, set of questions, vital signs, set of questions, assessment findings, etc. And then the open-ended questions that, again, capture the essence of next gen, but they're more difficult because they're open-ended.
I also created multiple levels of case studies. You know, the curriculum, we, if we go simple to complex, do we not? We start simple at fundamentals. We build until we get too advanced in the final semester and it gets complex to prepare for practice. My case studies start simple with skinny, go complex to unfolding. And then I have an answer key. You know, one thing that it drove me nuts as a new educator, it's like, where's the answer keys? <laughs> you know, not most of them didn't have them. They just assumed that you knew it. Well, I didn't know everything and I still don't. Neither do you. So I said, I'm going to write answer keys when I start to create tools for educators, give them a case, give them an answer key. And so again, you know, I've got, uh, I, I've got that. And what I want to share with you is basically, let me just kind of see if there's any other questions here. There is not. Um, what I want to do, I'm going to do something I haven't done before. I'm going to share with you a current, uh, my, 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 my current version of a Keith RN skinny reasoning. Skinny reasoning is my most concise level. It's on cirrhosis, a bread and butter GI topic. What I'm going to do tonight for the first time, and I'm really excited. I have been revising and updating over with, with the help of a little army of collaborators, as I'm so thankful for, every, all of my hundred plus topics have been completely updated, revised, and strengthened, kind of like version 2.0. What you see in my membership platform or what you've purchased in the past, that was 1.0. I'm going to share what's going to be coming in one week, a week from today, when I plan to launch these new resources inside the current membership platform. So if you're already a member, you'll get access to these in about a week to two weeks until we get everything transitioned over, but it's coming. So I'm really excited just to share with you the case studies that I currently have. And so what I'm going to do here is just kind of share my screen here. And basically, let me just um, kind of just open this up a little bit bigger here. And just uh, I want to show you kind of how I've got my case studies currently and basically kind of what's coming. So what I want you to see here is this, is that they always start with the scenario. And this is the student version. I have an answer key. They're writable PDFs. And what you'll see here is that I always ask the same question, what data is relevant and has clinical significance? So what's most important? What does it mean? That's always the first two steps of Tanner, noticing and interpreting. If you noticed, it's open-ended. So they have to choose what is most important based on their knowledge. There's no multiple choice, no prompting of any kind. Then a set of vital signs. And then they have to, again, choose what is most important and why. Assessment, what is most important and why. And then lab values. And again, looking at the, that, looking at the, the past and the, most re, and the current, looking at the trend, three clinical reasoning skills. What is most important or relevant? Look at her INRs. The INR is 1.5. Look at these liver labs. Look at the trend. What do these labs mean? Where is our trend going? So we're developing and practicing, but they have to cherry pick the, 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 the answers. They simulate practice just like it does in practice. And now we have five questions to put it all together. What is the primary problem? Kind of like what's the priority hypothesis is what next gen will ask in uh, step three. But then I want them to know their pathophysiology. So when you have a patient with an acute uh, you know, liver failure, what's going on? Here's the medical management. What's the rationale for the medical plan of care, the expected outcome, the nursing priority in the plan of care and expected outcome? Holistic care. I always want to bring in the importance of caring and the holistic care, depending on the scenario. And finally, educational and discharge priorities. And that was the essence of skinny reasoning that I've been doing for the last uh, for the last several years. What I'd like to share with you for the first time is I'm going to pop up what I've just revised of of the of the skinny level of cirrhosis. And what I just want you to see here is basically kind of how it's similar but more importantly how it's different. And so I'm going to share that with you here and let me just pull it up here so we have it. Excellent. And here it is. 
Now, what I want you to see with this skinny reasoning of the same patient is that I have completely rewritten the scenario. Uh, it's still a cirrhosis, but I completely had my content creators have a brand new scenario because unfortunately, some of my content is on places I don't want it to be, like Course Hero. And I have basically in the new platform and on all where my cases will be accessible, they'll only be embedded PDFs. There'll be nothing more to download. And so the membership platform is going to have a link for students to view the case study only. They can't download it. What you will share with your students is a link to view the case study, just like I'm doing right now. They can see the whole case, but they can't download it and they're unable to make any copies. And then they'll get a template of just the questions to fill out as a writable PDF. And that's going to keep the content secure. But what I want to show you is how I've improved the simulation or realism to best serve your needs and to bring even a better resource of case studies to your content. So again, you have a patient here, and, and I emphasize diversity. I wanted to bring in a, a lot more of a ethnic diversity, cultural diversity, social determinants of health. I was lacking when I wrote these several years ago. No more. They really are very rich and bring in a very nice, rich present problem in social history. What I've also done for the first time is I brought in contextual factors. And just like how the next gen NCLEX brings the context of practice. Oh, you know, your unit is short staffed and you're a brand new nurse. Well, guess what? When I wrote these, when I revised the case studies and updated them, everyone has a context. So this context is it's a busy day in urgent care. The unit is short staffed. You're the only nurse for four patients, but the unit leader was able to float a licensed practical nurse from OB to assist you. She does not know how to chart in your system, but has an IV certification that allows her to start intravenous access and IV fluids. So it's kind of like you're immersing students in the clinical practice setting. So now I start my questions and I make it a little bit more clear. What findings from the present problem are most important and noticed by the nurse as clinically significant? And these will be writable PDFs or they can print them up. So they can just in essence save it. And again, the template itself is going to have the questions. Social history, what's most important? Psychosocial history, contextual factors, what's most important and why? That's the noticing and interpreting steps that our students must have as they look at the medical record, as they get report. What am I noticing? What does it mean? But now I want to have fun. Patient care begins. I now have a real live Dynamap image of the vital signs, just like a nurse would collect it in practice. I used to have just a table that was just a Word document table. Now I'm bringing in practice of just a, a real life Dynamap image with their blood pressure, MAP, pulse, O2 sat, temperature, and their respiratory rate, because that's not on a Dynamap. You gotta calculate that. And then again, what vital signs are most important and why? Assessment findings. And then again, what's relevant and why? This is brand new. In a simple PDF document, instead of like, for example, my old cases used to say, respiratory, breath sounds clear, breath sounds coarse crackles, no more. Students will have to interpret breath sounds and heart sounds by simply just going to, they're going to do two things, just like in practice. My goal was to replicate practice in a case study as much as I could, even more than I did in my first gen. Put a circle on the chest where the nurse would place the stethoscope to auscultate the right upper lobe. So they're going to find, is it what side is the right? Where's the right upper? Is it here? Is it here? Wherever. They got to identify it, just like in practice. And now click the link to listen. Identify what's heard and interpret significance. And, oh, it doesn't, my link doesn't want to, oh, there it is. Oh, and you can do that as many times as you want to, to basically kind of put that together. And, uh, and so basically, let me just go back here. There we go. And so in essence, what you have here 
is the ability for the students to interpret breath sounds. The student interprets heart tones. I have embedded links to all of the adventitious heart sounds as well as normal heart tones. And I've also embedded images of assessment findings that are relevant for the first time. So now as you complete the head to toe, you notice this softball size discoloration on the abdomen. Now this patient has liver disease, end stage. What do we know about coagulation issues and platelets and other clotting factors that can be lacking? It can cause some bleeding, internal bleeding like bruising that's very prominent. And so again, what findings are most important and what do you notice is clinically significant with this bruise on the abdomen? Write it down, it's open-ended. Now you assess the lower legs. Now what do you notice? And you, your students need to interpret. They have to notice and interpret and then determine what the response will be based on images that they're going to see, which is just like what they're going to do in practice. And so I went and I purchased numerous medical images of these problems. This is petechiae, as you know, which again is a clotting problem, a bleeding problem that you see with cirrhosis. Now I want to show you my tables of the lab values. These look just like a medical record. In fact, EPIC is the dominant electronic health record here in the Midwest. I basically kind of made my tables to look just like EPIC, not looking like a next gen recipe card. I wanted it to look like practice. So again, reference ranges are there now for the first time. I didn't have reference ranges in my last set of uh, cases. I'm highlighting just like EPIC does. An exclamation point is what EPIC uses. And I don't know what other uh, Cerner or others doesn't matter, but it's highlighting. But again, the students need to notice what's most important. Why? Where is our trend going? You know, from the prior admission to the current, look at these labs. They have to inter notice it, but then interpret it using their knowledge of pathophys. Now you've got a metabolic panel, same thing. Creatinine is high. Is that a problem or not? What does that mean? Well, what's most important? Why? Where's our trend? Liver panel. We got a whole panel of just abnormal liver labs from acute uh, liver failure. And again, what's most important? Why? What does it mean? Coagulation. And then I use an activity called lab planning, which is looking at, you know, taking one bad lab and creating a plan of care with it. So what does ALT do? What does it mean? But then what are the priority assessments the nurse will do? That's the first part of noticing and interpreting skills. And if you notice, I kind of make these visible skills of clinical reasoning visible. If you notice what I have at the very top here is developing, noticing, and interpreting skills, making it visible that these thinking skills of clinical reasoning are a skill. It's a competency that we want to make visible to our students. Now we're going to go to part two, developing responding skills. Now what am I going to do? What's my possible problem, the priority problem, and the pathophysiology? Look at medical management, you know, anticipating what orders would I anticipate in this scenario and why? What about nursing management of care? What's my nursing priority, my priority intervention, rationale, and expected outcome? Look at education and discharge planning. What's my priority topics there? The, again, the holistic art of nursing. And then I close with the final skill of evaluation. You have a situation where now he's discharged, you resolve the problem, but six months later, he arrives in the ER and here's his current set of vital signs. When you remove his shirt, you notice this. Boy, what's happened here? He has progressed. He's got ascites. He is basically in end stage liver failure where he wasn't before. And so again, what do you notice? What does it mean? Assessment findings. You get one simple uh, panel that the doctor orders, a basic metabolic panel, INR. And now we have a three column matrix, just like next gen. Here's your assessment findings. Does marked confusion, mumbled speech, is this patient improved, no change or declined, et cetera? Making a judgment or a decision and then meet determining the patient's status. But then what I've added as well, documentation. Now it's the end of your shift. 
write a concise narrative note so your students can write right into this PDF or they can use print it up and, and, and do that. And then finally, reflection. The last skinny reasonings that I did several years ago had no reflection questions. That was a mistake, but then correcting it. And so now I'm asking students these four questions. As you work through this simulation, how did it make you feel? What did you already know and do well in this simulation? What do you need to do to develop and improve? And what did you learn? How will you apply what was learned to improve patient care? So just as you use debriefing questions in high fidelity simulation, what this really is, is not a case study, but it's a low fidelity simulation. And it replicates the thinking that you can bring into your classroom, your simulation, wherever you might be. And so just would like to know just kind of what you've thought of that. I see some comments here. Destiny says, oh, Michelle, I hope you saw the last half of it there at, at, at 247. I, I, I hope that you're able to see that because I did have it shared. So please confirm that you saw what I shared or I'll be very disappointed because I thought I had that successfully shared. And I hope we did. But Destiny says she loves it. Kathy says it's excellent. Excited to use it. Michelle, awesome job. And, uh, and thank you, Jamie, for just sharing. It's amazing. Michelle can't wait to use these. And so I want you to know that the membership that I have is kind of my best resource for educators. And again, you know, I'm, my goal is just to create the best tools for educators. And it's like, you know what? I do these Facebook Lives just to let you know what I to, to support your needs and to really communicate um, best practices. But if you'd like to learn more, I don't have the the membership is in kind of a state of transition right now because it's being rebuilt. You can still access it, but you cannot register if you'd like to purchase access until next Thursday. I think you can do it on Tuesday. We're going to have like a holding pattern and we're going to be able to basically kind of get you there. But the bottom line is, is that if you're already a member, you have access currently. When I flip the switch early next week, middle of next week, I'll have tutorials. You'll have these new case studies. You'll have the same answer keys that'll be better and more improved as well as PowerPoints that will present the content in class very efficiently with a slide-by-slide -slide approach. And so I've revised all my tools. I've got, there's a lot that I could share. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna have opportunities to do that in the weeks ahead, but I want you to know that next Thursday, after the NCSBN conference, uh, which will be over by four o'clock central, I'm going to have a Facebook Live at eight o'clock again next week. And what I'm going to do is answer your questions. I'd like to get a sense as far as, okay, what did you take away from this presentation? How are you, what are you going to do differently? And let's have a dialogue about that. But then I want to have a chance to show you because next week the membership will be live and I can show you some of the additional resources that are coming and how you can get individual access or my best value is departmental access and all of your faculty can get access to the case studies, the tools that are revised, faculty development webinars. Everything is being updated, including the tools for classroom, clinical. So I have been a very busy beer. I'm really tired even tonight. I've been going 16 hours a day getting this finalized. And so it's been a lot of work, but it's a really a labor of love because I know it's going to help serve your needs even more. More importantly, strengthen student learning. So again, um, excited to uh, to have that come. And, uh, you know, just want to thank you for your encouraging feedback. You know, when you're in your little home silo in your home office here in Minnesota, you kind of don't know, you know, are you really making a difference? Are these things really helpful? And so I'm really encouraged by your feedback. And I'm just really excited to have, I hope many of you will join me next week. Um, at the NCSBN conference. That is just a really humbling opportunity to serve the needs of educators because I'm kind of always been outside the box and I've not always been received well by my colleagues in nursing education. I've had a very broken road, if I were to be brutally honest with you. And um, I kind of have got that kind of like that cloud of like, who is it, pig pen, that little cloud over him sometimes. If anybody's experienced that, I have, as I know many of you have. And, um, and so I'm just humbled that Dr. Dickinson saw the value of what I'm doing. 
presenting it to educators across the country and Canada. And so, you know what, let's bring about change together. You know what, this is not about Keith RN. This is about strengthening and transforming and really implementing Dr. Benner's vision. You know, Dr. Benner just turned 80 years old. I want to honor her legacy by, and I hope every one of you as educators, you know, she approaches the end of her journey on this earth. You know what? It's my passion to make her known and to really just to, 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 to implement the changes that are not only going to bring about a fulfillment to that legacy, but more importantly, improving patient outcomes. You know, we've got to get our eyes off of NCLEX success. Yes, it's important. Yes, it's a, it's a state board metric. But if, we, if we're not careful, which I think we're already in danger of, we're putting the cart before the horse. We're not putting practice first, patient outcomes first. And that's my passion. And I'm thankful to have many of you joining me tonight that will listen to this link in the future. And just want you to know you've got an advocate to help strengthen nursing education in your program. And uh, and so, yeah, just want to say thank you. And I'm glad, Jeanina. I hope I, I I can't pronounce that. I can see it barely with my cheaters there. But I, uh, I, I think I butchered your name. But I, I'm glad you like the cases. And, you know, it's my goal to bring best practices, put them to good use, and get those graduates nurse thinking. Uh, Kathy, I totally agree. And, uh, you know, let's be part of the needed change. You know, that's really my passion is just to lead that change. You know what, I'll put myself out there. I'll say things that aren't popular, but they're what ne it's, it's what needs to be said. And if you've got ears to hear, which I think you do, or you wouldn't be here, join me. And let's be part of the solution and be part of the needed change. And it's my pleasure to best serve your needs. And I look forward to seeing you next week at the NCSBN conference and look forward to your feedback from that, as well as your questions next week. And I look forward to connecting with you in this platform one week from today. So blessings on your journey. Let's rock it together and let's be the needed change that's so desperately needed right now. God bless and take care. Good night.